Welcome to Conservation 101, Urban Agriculture Field Experiences. Lesson 1 of the Intro to Urban Agriculture. Let's get growing. Offered by the Lehigh County Conservation District with support from the National Association of Conservation Districts, the Ryder Pool Foundation, and the Harry C. Trexler Trust. What is urban agriculture? Some may think the term about growing efficiently in unique areas found in, around, and on top of cities, boroughs, and villages is a new practice. However, many methods consisting of this type of growing have actually been going on for centuries, even thousands of years. If you take into consideration the growing systems such as the hanging gardens of Babylon or the floating aquaponic growing beds installed in the lakes by the Aztec natives. Urban agriculture has roots in more recent local history as well. The Lenape Native Americans in the Delaware Valley utilized companion planting and pest management in their village gardens when they grew in circular plots. These gardens were comprised of corn stalks in the center, surrounded by nitrogen supplying beans that grew up the lattice like structure provided by the corn. Encircling all of this, the natives planted a protective guard wall of prickly squash meant to deter wild animals from eating the important crops. During the early 20th century, household backyard gardening in plots called truck patches was a necessary part of the war effort to help American farmers provide ample supply of food to win World War II. These patches helped give rise to the practice of compact raised bed gardening often utilized in urban landscape today. The Environmental Protection Agency defines and outlines benefits of urban ag in the following way. City and suburban agriculture takes the form of backyard, rooftop and balcony gardening, community gardening in vacant lots and parks, roadside urban fringe agriculture, and livestock grazing in open space. Urban agriculture is an important source of environmental and production efficiency benefits. The use of best management practices and integrated farming systems protect soil fertility and stability, prevent excessive runoff, provide habitats for a widened diversity of flora and fauna, reduce the emissions of CO2, increase carbon sequestration, and reduce the incidence and severity of natural disasters such as floods and landslides. Decorative or scenic agriculture landscapes, waterways, and buildings provide numerous benefits including recreational activities, scenic views, and open space qualities. These positive benefits often merit assistance to producers such as technical, financial, and other public support. During Lehigh County Conservation District's three-year pilot of this growing curriculum, students, teachers, farmers, conservation scientists, businesses, and organizations have all come together to explore how urban agriculture can be used to benefit and revitalize our local urban community of Allentown. The idea has been to introduce students to basic growing skills, work with them to implement gardening in the unique areas that comprise their learning environment, and then finally explore new technology and 21st century paths that are being taken in the agriculture industry that faces challenges of needing to feed 9 billion humans by the year 2050. Some highlights during this course include Growing where we live Learning about crucial plant nutrients while making soil mixes Addressing overproduction of waste through composting with worms Preserving biodiversity by compiling personal seed bulbs Thinking about sustainability by growing aquaponically Addressing the 21st century challenges in growing hydroponically. Addressing indoor and outdoor farming challenges by mitigating for pests. Understanding how to conserve through rain barrel construction. Creating recipes and cooking with our food. Designing unique urban ag business ideas that address social, environmental, and economic issues. Each lesson plan in this series is accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation that can be utilized with students in the classroom as a preliminary introduction to corresponding activities. If the curriculum is being used in an informal setting, it is still good to become familiar with the elements discussed within the presentation so that you have speaking points prepared as you complete projects and activities with your students. We will now take you through the Lesson 1 Intro to Urban Ag, Let's Get Growing. What is urban agriculture? Because there are so many aspects to this type of growing, the true answer is quite lengthy. The short answer, however, very simply put, is that urban ag is all about growing where you live. This can mean using resources available to grow plants out of doors, in containers, in raised beds, or inside a windowsill. It can be space efficient by growing up a wall or roof, or it can be resource efficient as well by installing a rain barrel to capture roof runoff for watering plants. Urban Ag is using worm compost bins so that kitchen scraps can be turned into nutrient-rich soil instead of heading to the landfill where decomposition gives off dangerous greenhouse gases. Urban Ag can be designing a rain garden to help with stormwater control. It can involve landscape design inside or outside to improve air quality and provide inviting, relaxing, and interesting spaces. Urban Ag can involve starting a cool new food business, plant retailer, and can even be an avenue for providing mental health support. Urban agriculture involves technology, like growing aquaponically with fish, or hydroponically with nutrient additives, and aeroponically with nutrient mist sprays. 
Urban ag can involve critters. Bees and birds and bugs are welcome. Even fish can be farmer friends. Some people may think of urban ag as a new trend, but it's not. It's been around for thousands of years. Have you ever heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? They are a great example, from more than 2,000 years ago. Centuries ago in Aztec civilization, brilliant Central American natives already knew how to grow without soil using floating reed rafts and fish and lake systems. Our first public parks were implemented in the 1800s along with plant shops and pleasure gardens. In the 1900s, a wave of urban agriculture in the form of resident growing and backyard truck patches allowed citizens to aid farmers in the food production necessary for winning World War II. Let's face it, as long as we're around, we're going to need to breathe, have food to eat, and get outside for some recreation in order. Urban ag has everything to do with this and it's been around since the dawn of civilization. It's not going anywhere. Maybe you're still not sure how urban ag could fit into your future. Well, here's some food for thoughts regarding careers. According to 21sttech.com, urban ag has its foot in the door for emerging industries of artificial intelligence, agriculture, genomics, food tracking, and ag analytics just to name a few. Scientists are studying plant genes to improve plant yield, plant nutrition, and produce taste. Genomics is even being used to better understand medicinal values of cannabis and many other plants. Artificial intelligence is being used for packaging produce, for seed spacing, for grafting and managing growth of plants. Artificial intelligence is also being utilized to manage efficiencies and energy conservation. In the computer tech field, programs are being developed to help farmers track the harvest as well as the weather. Analytic models are being built for farmers as well as programs to help with food ordering and sales. Food monitoring and tracking systems are also being built to reduce recalls. Agritecture is a new term that combines ag, technology, and architecture to maximize food production in small or large spaces. Food growing in this way can take place on any scale, in a small backyard as vertical grow wall or in a large warehouse. Tech.com notes that when this type of growing is fully understood, we'll be ready to farm in outer space. So that's the long and the short of it. If you enjoy growing plants, if you find science and technology interesting, if you care about making your community healthier and more sustainable, if you're an entrepreneur or a foodie, if you love critters or just want a cool place to hang out, Urban Ag is definitely for you. Let's get growing. Hi, my name's Jolie Shylack, and I wanted to thank you for joining the Lehigh County Conservation District as we bring our urban agriculture curriculum to you. We have a series of do-it-yourself videos, uh, which we're hoping will make it easier for you to, to uh, implement some of these projects in your class. Um, today, we're going to learn about propagating sweet potatoes. Um, and this is a really fun project to do in the beginning of the urban egg um, curriculum because sweet potatoes, you can start this growing project early in the year and you can grow the whole way um, throughout the spring and then um, by early summer when the kids are going home, um, you can plant uh, the product into the garden and then by the next fall when the kids come back, there will be sweet potatoes growing in your garden and uh, if the kids wanna take their sweet potato slips home with them, they can also plant them in their own gardens at home. Let's talk about what propagation really is. Uh, so propagating is just growing plants from plants, and there are three ways that you can do that. You can use seeds, which is the most common way of doing it. Uh, you plant seeds from a flower of a plant into the ground. Um, you can use parts of plants. Uh, this is done a lot of times with root vegetables, like sweet potatoes, uh, where you plant the, the tuber, uh, and, and you use that to grow uh, foliage from. The third way that you can do it is by taking a cutting from a plant. So let's talk about sweet potatoes and actually what they are. They're a really nutritious uh, vegetable. They're high in vitamin C and also in um, mineral content. Uh, they have iron in them. And they're also very um, fibrous, so they provide all sorts of nutritional benefits. This is the tuber, as I was saying, part of the plant, and it's part of the root system. And actually, it gets big like this, and potatoes also are the same way because they're overwintering vegetables. And so they need to have lots of nutrients and uh, to allow that plant to survive through the winter. And those nutrients are collected in the tuber throughout the winter. And then when temperatures warm up, 
when there's some rain, um, there will be little plants growing out of the eyes in um, the potatoes. So uh, that is a little bit about sweet potatoes. Let's talk about exactly what we need to grow sweet potato slips. Okay, so it's good to have a jar. Of course, you need sweet potatoes and toothpicks. Also some food coloring and um, a Q-tip so that you can make some decorations on your sweet potatoes. And a scissors is good for the trimming. Also, I have some water. Very important to have the water. So the first thing that you can do is you can have your kids decorate the sweet potatoes if they want to. This isn't something you have to do, but it's kind of fun, especially if you use a sweet potato as like your beginning project and you have them, we call them sweet potato buddies. And so you kind of can have a sweet potato that um, is growing in your growing classroom from January all the way through spring. So maybe the kids would want to put a smiley face on, maybe just their name or a design, whatever they choose. The next thing that you'll need to do is fill up your container with water. And you want the potato to be sitting about a third of the way in the water. And this can be a little bit of a messy part of this project. So I'm going to just take this out and see where I need to be now. Let's see here. So I'm going to actually turn this one this way. Okay, so that is definitely not a third of the way in. I'll add some more water. Try not to spill it all over the place. There we go. Okay. So once you have your potatoes sitting in there nicely, um, you can also add some toothpicks. Sometimes the, sm the bottom end of the potato kind of gets a little bit smaller throughout the process and you don't want the sweet potato falling into the water so you can use toothpicks that'll prevent that from happening and you really only need two I'm, this is extra fortification I guess um, so then the next thing that you need to do is find a sunny place to put your plant um, if you have a window sill in your classroom, that's perfectly fine. Um, or a grow light that you can set up, that's a good idea too. Once you've uh, gotten your sweet potato to this point, it'll take about eight weeks before you start to see little sprouts form. Um, eight to 10 weeks, and then these are the slips that are growing. And once the slips start growing, uh, you want them to get anywhere between four and six inches. And once they become four to six inches long, you cut them off at a diagonal. And you actually just move our little guy over there. Put the slip itself into water so that it can start growing some roots. These roots have been, this slip was cut about two weeks ago. Um, and so it doesn't really take a long time for the roots to begin to grow. And once you've gotten those nice roots growing, the next thing that you're going to want to do is plant your sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes, sweet potato slips should be planted mid-June um, when it gets really warm outside. And you can plant them in a large container, um, something probably a little larger than this. This works out in the space that we're using today, but a, a really large container or possibly um, a raised bed garden is good. And so you actually just allow, allow the plant to grow right in your container. And as I said, you put this out in June and you water it all summer long. And by late August, early September, you should have quite a few potatoes growing underneath each slip. Um, the students can take their sweet potatoes home once they've gotten the slips and then and root them at home and grow them in their own gardens over the summer uh, if, if you'd like them to see the process through the summer. Or 
Um, you can use the potatoes that you grow in your own garden at school uh, the next fall. And early on in the fall, you can harvest those potatoes. We have um, a nutritionist from Penn State Extension who comes in and helps us out uh, by teaching the kids how to uh, make some healthy recipes from the things that we've growing that we've been growing. And when we do that, uh, she mashes up the sweet potatoes and turns them into sweet potato pancakes, which is a really nice way to start the year. So I really recommend sweet potato. Uh, buddies and growing the slips um, as a really easy beginning way to work with your urban ag students. And I hope you have fun uh, just like I do when we do this in class. Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Jolie Shylack, and thank you for joining the Lehigh County Conservation District and our urban agriculture curriculum video where uh, we demonstrate another activity uh, that you can do with your students in the first lesson. Um, this is making microgreens. You might wonder what microgreens are, actually, and they're just basically seedling plants um, that are cut and trimmed very early on in their growth and can be used for food um, of varying types. It's really fun to do this with the kids because uh, the results are pretty quick. You can grow microgreens in about two weeks. Right here I have sunflower seeds that uh, I scattered in the pan about two weeks ago and, and these are pea shoots. You can also grow microgreens from beet seeds and from carrots, also radishes, lettuces are great. Uh, and they're, they're a really nutritious source of food, uh, especially if you're able to grow your microgreens in sunlight in a windowsill, um, but they can also be gr grown under a grow light. So what do we need to be able to, to grow our microgreens? Uh, we, of course, need a shallow baking pan um, filled 3 quarters of the way with soil. Um, we need some topsoil. We need the seeds. And of course, some water. And a lid. Um, baking pans make perfect greenhouses. And so we'll, we'll do all these things now. Let's see here. So it's very simple to grow microgreens. As I mentioned before, you want to have some nice quality soil, uh, topsoil. Uh, you can use compost if you want. And um, you fill up your tin about 3 quarters of the way. And then the key with microgreens is that you really want to grow them in a dense way and so you broadcast the seeds almost as if it were snowing. I tell the students, like, pretend it's snowing sunflower seeds. Oh, you might, might have been wondering. I'm actually using black oil sunflower seeds today. Um, they just, they're, they're a very inexpensive way to get this project done with lots of kids in a class. So we've got our layer of sunflower seeds and you basically just don't want to see the soil below. And then when you have the sunflower seeds down, you just need to cover it up with some soil. And you don't even really need a lot of soil at this point either. About a quarter, quarter of an inch on the top will do. And hopefully by now, if you've read the lesson plan, you'll know that a very important way to get a seed to sprout is that it needs to have contact with soil so that the sprout can, the root can get to the nutrients, but also there, it needs to be wet. So after I cover this, I'm going to spray it with water. And I'm actually not going to use a watering can in this case. I'm going to use a sprayer, as I said, because when you use a watering can, sometimes it pushes the dirt right off the top of the seed. So using a spray can and just giving it a good spray is probably the better way to water in this case. After you're finished with that, your seeds 
are ready to be put in a windowsill. You can put the lid on the top here, especially if you're going away for the weekend and you might not have a chance to water. Um, if you put a lid on top, then you'll kind of get the water cycle going inside this small greenhouse. But every day, check your seeds um, and give them lots of water, uh, sunflower seeds, tend to um, really suck up a lot of water. And it's really a good idea. Uh, if, you, if you happen to miss a watering and you notice that your sunflower microgreens have wilted, you can actually just water them with a, a lot and they'll come back up. So they're, they're pretty resilient. I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't go two or three days without watering them, but if they look like they're, they're drooping, you can just uh, add some more water and you might find within an hour that they recover nicely. So as I said, you'll want to um, place, if you're able, place your seedlings in a windowsill. And it, with sunflower seeds, you'll notice that they start growing in about four days. It's a really satisfying project for the students because they see the growth right away. Um, and um, also with pea shoots. And with carrots and radishes and beets, they're a little bit slower to grow, and their greens are a little bit shorter, but they're still very tasty. So it's kind of fun also to have taste tests with these different microgreens. Sunflower seeds taste a little bit nutty. Um, pea shoots are rather sweet. Um, the radish uh, tastes a little bit like radish and carrots the same. And um, so when it's time, when you've grown them and it's time to cut them, you cut them at about a quarter of an inch from the soil. And then of course you're going to want to wash them well in a colander and dry them. And then they're ready to be used. Uh, we use them in a variety of ways. Uh, there, we have a great nutritionist from Penn State Extension that comes to help us, as I've mentioned before. She has helped us make green smoothies. I actually have a special recipe uh, of that I call the recipe of twos, where I use two cups of sunflower microgreens, two cups of ice, two cups of yogurt, two cups of pineapples or mangoes, and then two bananas. And I put that all in a blender, blend it up for you know, a minute or so, and the kids have a nice green, healthy smoothie. Um, you can do that with pea shoots as well. Another thing that's really easy to do with the kids is maybe have a cracker and then um, put some dressing on, whether it be ranch or blue cheese or, or um, some kind of creamy dressing, and then the microgreens on top. Kids really seem to enjoy that as well. Uh, it's a great additive to salads. You can even turn it into a little um, kind of a fundraiser for school. I know the teachers at our school love to make green drinks, so we would bag our microgreens up for them and they'd take them home and, and use them at home um, in the blender or even just to use in salads and, or in soup and that kind of thing. So I hope you have a lot of fun making uh, microgreen gardens in your school and I'll look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for joining us. For more information on the Urban Agriculture Field Experiences lesson plan, visit www.lehighconservation.org or follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube pages. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out the rest of the videos in our Urban Agriculture lesson plan series.